number 11 this morning, Hebrews chapter number 11, and it's good to be in God's house today, amen, and I got for you, now children, Brother Gary was right, we want you to watch your parents, keep a good eye on them, and grandparents, whoever you're sitting with today, keep a good eye on them if they need to get up or start making noise, you just call them down, all right, it won't work that way, all right, we'll do just fine, children, we love you in the Lord this morning, we want you to be with us today, and uh, if you got a small one, you need to get up and go out, you just do that. And feel free to do that. You can come right back in when you can. Hebrews chapter number 11. Hebrews chapter number 11. And if you've got God's book in your hand, you got the Word of God in your hand, say amen. 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 You found that? Hebrews chapter number 11. And we'll begin reading in verse number 8. I'll give you a break from verses 1 through 6. Verse number 8. Verse number 8. And uh, follow along with me down there to just verse number 10. Follow along with me. Uh, in fact, let's read aloud together. And before we begin to read to you, I see, now I have a couple signs in church. Some of those signs are when people who are normally freezing are fanning. I know, I know that we're about to pass out in here, all right? So let's take it down just one degree right there, and we'll get the air circulating. It'll get to circulating there. We'll be circulating in just a minute. We'll be fine there. Hebrews chapter number 11, and uh, we, we, uh, we, want you, we want it to be nice and cool in here uh, and be the frozen chosen. No, we don't want to do it. Hebrews chapter, <laughs> Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 8, and uh, let's read out loud together. Ready to begin. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Verse 10, last one. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. We are talking about living the life of faith. There are several examples in Hebrews chapter number 11 of lives of faith, but... Abraham is the one we're studying. This is about the fifth or sixth sermon we're going to preach on that. The call to follow Christ is a call to live by faith. Say amen. amen right there. Amen. We've been called to live by faith. The very essence of our walk with God is by faith. 2 Corinthians 5 says, For we walk by faith and not by sight. That means the call to walk with the Lord is going to take some faith. We're going to see in Genesis this morning, we'll get you turned there as soon as we see we have a word of prayer, that there are three chapters to Abraham's life. Three chapters. You say, no, there's more than that. I know there's more than that. But there are three chapters to Abraham's life of faith. And I believe every believer, every believer today faces those same chapters. My desire for us this morning is to figure out where we are, to know where God wants us to go and to get there. Let's offer our lives to the Lord today. Amen. Amen. Father, we come to you this morning. Thank you for the word. Thank you for the singing, the praise. Thank you for reaching down and touching us. Lord, unless you meet with us this morning, unless you work in this church this morning, unless you work in the heart of each believer here, or unless you work in the heart of whatever unbeliever that is here, Father, unless you do a work, we're just kind of here playing charades a little bit. Well, we don't want to do that today. We want you to meet with us. Thank you so much for this life of faith that you've allowed us to live, that you've called us to. Lord, we want to please you. Your word tells us very clearly, without faith, it's impossible to please you. Father, the flip side of that is with faith, it is possible to please you. So help us to live by faith. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated right there. This morning we're going to go back a little bit. We're going to go in reverse a little bit in the life of Abraham. I want you to go to chapter number 11, please, this morning. In Genesis chapter number 11 this morning. Chapter number 11 before we get into the sermon today. We've, we've looked at several things about the, the life to live by faith and that if God calls you somewhere, He's calling you to leave something. And, God always calls us to that, and, and that if you're going to live by faith, you have to reject what's in front of you, what there is right in front of you. You're going to have to reject that so that you can get what God has prepared for you. And we are not real good as people, as Christians, as people living in this culture, we're not real good at waiting. How many of you understand, would be honest this morning and say, I'm not real good at waiting on things, all right? Uh, my favorite time is now. My favorite time is now. And anytime God does something immediately, that's always a good time in my life. But I want to tell you something. Rarely has God, and He's done a few things, but rarely has God ever done anything immediately in my life. I've prayed uh, prayers, and I thought the Lord is going to answer this tomorrow because it's crunch time. It's got to happen tomorrow. You ever prayed a prayer like that? It's got to happen tomorrow, Lord, as we give Him the 411 on what He needs to do like He needs it. And we sit there and we say, Lord, and it doesn't happen tomorrow. 
It happens three days late. Lazarus. But Lord always comes at the right time. Amen. And then there are things where I've said, Lord, this can't happen now. Lord, whatever you do, don't let it happen now. This is not the right time. And the Lord has allowed that to happen at His time, and it's never been my time. It's hard for me to figure out exactly, but I do know this. God's timetable and my timetable are rarely ever the same, and I'm trying to learn to get uh, and to learn to wait on that. And to wait on God's timetable takes faith. It takes faith. We're going to look at the life of Abraham this morning, three chapters of his life. I think they're very clear, even though his story goes several chapters. I want to go back again. And as we look at Abraham's life, we've got to understand this morning that he is not a perfect man. This is what I love about the Bible. The only perfect person in the Bible is the Bible, Jesus. Amen. He's the only one. Anybody that's ever been used, God has, any person God has ever used, he's always used a sinner. He's always used people who have made mistakes. He's always you people who have not got it quite right. And this morning, I want to look at, right in to Abraham's life at three chapters of living by faith. I will tell you this morning, you're in one of these three chapters. You're in one of these areas of Abraham's life. Uh, uh, it's either chapter 1, chapter 2, or chapter 3. We'll see what those are in just a minute. But I want you to begin reading with me chapter 11 and uh, just follow along here. And most of this is introductory. I have three points at the end, all right, I think, uh, whatever the end may mean. Hebrews, uh, Genesis chapter number 11. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abram, and Nahor, and Haran, and Haran begat Lot. And Haran died before his father Terah in the land of his nativity in the Ur of the Chaldees. And Abraham and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abraham's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife Milcah, and the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Iscah. But as Sarai was barren, she had no child. We never spend much time on this portion of Abraham's life. But I want you to notice chapter number one of any life of faith is the wretched years. The wretched years. Abraham's past is one of obscurity and misery. Before God put a spotlight on Abraham, he was nothing to be known of. The Bible says of Job that he was, he was the most well-known man in his land. He was righteous. He was wealthy. I mean, everybody knew who Job was. But here, just in the history of God, we just see this little guy from the Ur of the Chaldees pop up. And his name is Abraham. This place, Ur, was the very center for the sun and moon worship of his time. It was a perverse place. The Bible doesn't say a lot about it. We could go through, but history tells us many things. There was a lot of perversion, spiritual darkness, a lot of wickedness. Abraham was born in the epicenter, was raised in the epicenter of pagan, occultic worship. Most likely, everybody starts to think, well, Abraham must have been in Sunday school his whole life. Abraham wasn't in Sunday school his whole life. Abraham grew up a pagan. He grew up in a pagan place. He grew up in a pagan land. He grew up with a pagan father and a pagan family. And the Bible says nothing about the spirituality in, any, in, way, in a good way of Abraham and his family. In fact, I think we can infer as we look a little bit later, Abraham's father, uh, family was no doubt a hindrance to what God was wanting to do. That's why God said, you need to leave them. Mm -hmm. We'll look at that in just a minute. The people were involved in miserable, wicked forms of worship. And that was where Abraham came from. The time that Abraham's life that we find here in chapter number 11, although it's just a few short chapters, it's just a few short verses, excuse me. You say, well, pastor doesn't say anything about it. That's because there's nothing worth saying. It was a time of wickedness in his life, a time of darkness. And out of this condition, God called him to himself. By the way, can we pause for a minute? Isn't that how God called all of us? Amen. Out of a life of darkness, out of a life of sin, out of a life of wretchedness, we are no different than Abraham. I want you to turn me to, to 1 Corinthians chapter number 6 this morning. Keep your finger there in Genesis. I want you to notice what the Bible says about us. You go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I'll be with you there in just a minute. You're a chosen generation, the Bible says. You go to 1 Corinthians 6. I'm reading another verse here. You're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of Him who have called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. God called you and me. If you're saved this morning, God called you out of darkness. Say amen right there. Amen. Aren't you thankful that God looks in the dark places for people, not just those who are walking in the light, because there's none righteous, no, not one. As we think about this life of faith, the first point I'm trying to make to you is this. We get this idea that the people who live by faith have perfect backgrounds. 
These people who've got, who live a this life of faith, they are amazing, outstanding Christians. And God looked at them and He said, there's something I can work with. There's a vessel that's already just got it figured out. I mean, I, look at the people He used. Peter. Peter was a cussing fish man, fisherman. Peter had a bad mouth. Now, he shouldn't have kept that. That's no excuse for one. Somebody say amen right there. All right, people say amen. Well, Peter cussed. Well, he also denied the Lord. You're going to do that too. Amen. Oh, that's not to adopt everything. But I'm just trying to say this morning, God does not use perfect people because there are none. You're going to walk by faith. If you're going to walk by faith, you need to recognize that God has called you out of a wretched, dark place, but he has called you into his marvelous life. Are you there First 1 Corinthians chapter 6? I'm not, all right? I need to get over there. I told you to get there and I didn't. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. I want to establish this chapter of my life. I want to establish this chapter of your life. Some of us this morning, some of us this morning need to recognize how good we have it. Some of us need to recognize and remember how bad we were. See, here's what happens a lot of times. You start walking with the Lord and you start walking around like God never saved you out of anything. Hello? See, if you've got it all figured out, if, if God didn't have to reach down too far for you, then you're really never going to live by faith because you're not that dependent upon the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. Why am I in chapter 15? I'm just all over the place today. Can't get the hymns right. Can't even get in here. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Verse number 9. Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And we pause right there. We hear that. We say, that's right. Amen. And that is true. That's still Bible. We ought to say amen right there. Is it still the Bible? Yes. Yeah. yes. The Bible is not changed because of culture. Yeah. All right? God is unchangeable. Yeah. And some people say, you want to be relevant. You've got to be relevant. God's always relevant because yeah. he is the I am. But here's something we need to understand that verses 9 and 10, they tell us all these things. Well, look at verse number 11. And such were what? Some of you. Paul said, hey, Corinthians, remember, this is what you used to be. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And everybody ought to do a backflip right now. You ought to be jumping up, high-fiving one another and saying, praise God. Because here's the truth about this. And this is, I'm just trying to encourage you this morning. We've got this idea because we've got a history and a past that God can't use you. That God can't do anything. We think this life of faith is for the super Christian and for those who have played it straight 100% of the time and those who don't have too much baggage in their life. Well, I'm pretty sure when Paul looked at verse number 11, he says, y'all have got a lot of baggage in your life. You were some of these people. Hello? And he says, but you're not that anymore. He says, why? Because you've been sanctified. That means set apart. You've been justified. You've been declared righteous by the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. What a blessing that we have there in verse number 11. Turn with me to Titus chapter number 3. Titus chapter number 3. We're going to live by faith. He said, Pastor, why in the world are you talking about the wretched part of our lives and the wretched year of Abraham's life? Why are you talking about that? Titus chapter number 3. And I'll tell you as soon as I find it. Amen. Sometimes my Bible plays tricks on me, all right? The books move around, I'm pretty sure. Titus, please. Titus chapter number 3. Titus chapter number 3. One of my favorite passages in all of the Bible. Titus chapter number 3. I should say all of them are, but Titus chapter number 3. As I get into Titus chapter 3 this morning, I want to, to tell you something. It's never a good idea to rehearse what the devil did to you. But it's always a great idea to remember what God has done for you. Yeah. It's never a good idea to rehearse what Satan has done in your life. When you give testimony what God has done with you, don't go down memory lane so far that everybody gets all the details. I mean, a lot of times I, I, I've, I've been around and maybe youth groups and somebody get up and they get newly saved and they give testimony in the church and we think, oh, no. I mean, I didn't even know what some of these words meant. The Lord, I used to be this and I used to be that. We're thinking, you know, time out. Anybody been in one of those situations right there? We don't need to know all of that. It's not good to rehearse what the devil has done for you and done to you. But it's always great to remember what God has done for you. And if you're going to walk by faith, you need to remember that your wretched life that you used to live, one that you had one, but two, it's gone. It's gone. Titus chapter number three. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish. Do you recognize Paul always reminded 
his audience, what you used to be? Was he trying to drag them down? Was he trying to sit there and say, you're not good, you're no good for nothing, you can't go live for God? No, what Paul was reminding them is that no matter what they were, who God was was greater. Titus chapter 3, verse 1, we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. That's some bad news right there. Verse number 4. But after that, this is not my devotional Bible, but in my devotional Bible that I read, I've got that underlined many times. I've got it circled, boxed, and starred. I thank God for the after that. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us by the washing and regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Verse number 6, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Y'all got muffins in your mouth? Y'all be saying amen right there. Yeah. Listen, I'm going to tell you something right now. People, and I'm not chiding you here, but uh, there were sports on yesterday, people hooping and hollering and all these kinds of things. That stuff doesn't matter anything at all. Yeah. This right here matters, amen? Yeah. And I, I'm, just, I'm not saying, we all have different personalities. You know, I yeah. cheer and get excited at the toad races. I mean, I, I, mean, I do. I frog, I, 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 that's my personality. But I want to tell you this morning, if it doesn't elicit a response from your mouth, at the very least it ought to elicit a response from your heart and your mind. There ought to be some joy in here today that God gave you an after that. Whatever you were, God showed up after that. And He came and He shed abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior that being justified by His what? His grace. We should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Pause here. You know what happened in your wretched life? God's grace showed up and He took you out of the kingdom of darkness and put you in the kingdom of His dear Son. He shed on you abundantly His marvelous grace and He's made you into something you never deserved to be. Amen. God reached down in the wretched years of our lives and, and He's touched us and we can now rejoice what God has done. I'm just trying to lay the foundation here that those who live by faith are not people with no past, they're people with an incredible past and God has reached past that. God is so good to us. Our heart rejoices. Should be rejoicing that God can reach into the deepest, darkest heart and turn on the light of His glory and His presence. Yep. I, I, I want to go ahead and go on record here. And I differ with some of my brethren. I mean brethren, I'm talking about other pastors and ministries. I, I'm going to go on record here. I don't believe in second class Christians. Amen. I'm going to show you. Go with me to 1 Timothy, please. 1 Timothy chapter number 1. You're right there in Titus. Just go back a little bit. I'm trying to keep you close. We want to know why people don't live by faith anymore. People are writing books about it. I want to tell you what often happens though. Often from the pulpit, we preach and teach that those who live by faith somehow have, have a perfect background. That God uses those who have just done it right from the very beginning. But there's nobody like that. <laughs> Living by faith is for the super Christian. There's no such thing as a super Christian. First Timothy chapter number one. I'm just establishing that in every life of faith, you got some wretched years. Remember it. Own it. It is what it is. And you say, Well, I don't have any wretched years. Well, then you're wretched in your self righteousness. Yeah. Right, preacher. Amen. Yeah, come on, preacher. Don't throw the yeah. chairs at me. Nobody's sitting today, all right? Yeah. See, we need to, there's something else that needs to happen. There's two swings of people, really, in Christianity. People who are saved. Those who are, oh, I'm so everything's so horrible. I'm a nothing. I'm a this. I'm a that. I'm a worthless. Yeah, we're all worthless. None of us are worthy. Right. And boy, you got that. Then you got the other side of you think nothing's ever attached itself to you. You've never done anything wrong. Both streams are wrong. Yeah. Amen. We remember, we remember what God has done for us. First Timothy chapter number one. Did I tell you to get there? I yes. hope I did. First Timothy chapter number one. I thank God, verse number twelve. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me, for that he accounted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Wow, we think, my goodness gracious, Paul must have been a very special guy because he was counted faithful. Verse 13. Who was before? A blasphemer. Everybody's got a chapter 13 in their life, all right? All right, verse 13 was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly and unbelief. Yeah. And the grace of our Lord Jesus was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. Right here, are you ready for this? 
Paul, this is a neat phrase here. Paul says, this is something worth paying attention to. It's worthy that everybody in this room, if Paul was preaching in this room right now, he says, every single one of you need to believe this. Every single one of you need to accept this, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Yeah. How be it? Oh, I love verse number 16. I'm trying not to get fired up. I've had coffee today. How be it for this cause? I obtained mercy. That in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on Him to life everlasting. Do you hear what Paul said? Paul said, my life was injurious. I was a blasphemer and I was this and I was that. But God reached down and touched me so that I could kind of be an example of what God can do with those sinners. I'm an example of what God can do with a wretched life. God can take a wretched life and take it from darkness and turn it into life. I was singing the song this morning. Uh, I won't sing it to you today. I wish I had the words. If I had it, I'd sing it. I had it at home. All right, it was my song to the Lord today. Uh, the drunk on the street. God saves old sinners. How many know that? Anybody know that song? Yes. About four of us right here. Oh, I was singing that. It was a blessing to everybody that heard it. Uh, absolutely, all right? But listen, I want to tell you something. I'm just trying to tell you. Paul said, look, the reason I've got this horrible past, I've got this horrible history, but Jesus, me, the chiefest of sinners, Paul said, he has shown his long suffering, not Paul's long suffering, his long suffering in saving me so that I can be a pattern and example to anybody who believes after me. What was Paul saying? I've got a wretched past, but I'm living a life by faith because God's grace and mercy can reach down and touch anybody. Amen. And when God's mercy reaches down and touches you, you have been my brother and sister, but it put on the life of faith. Amen. God didn't put you on the back shelf. He put you on the front page, and He's allowing you to live by faith. God takes lives that are insignificant, barren, hopeless, and He turns them into examples of His mercy, power, and His grace. Amen. See, i got a chapter in my life. It only lasted until I was about four years old. <laughs> I got saved at a very young age. But those four years, you ask my sisters, those were wretched years. <laughs> they were wretched years. No one is beyond the touch of God. Abraham was once a pagan. God reached down and touched his life. The whole point is this. The life of faith isn't just for those with a perfect history. Because nobody has one. We don't know a lot about these years of Abraham. The life of faith is about moving forward with God, not looking back at the time without Him. I see so many people caught up in their past. I want to talk to you this morning just a little bit. So many people caught up in their past. And I just wish that you would think about your past like God does. Or better yet, like God doesn't. Mm -hmm. Hello? Yes. Thank you. See, if you, if you and I, it's a good thing to remember we got some wretched years. It keeps us humble. It keeps us trusting the Lord. But it's a bad thing to dwell there. You've got to lay that aside. You've got to put that behind you. If your wretched years didn't keep God from saving you, they won't keep God from using you. Yeah. Amen. Say amen right yeah. amen. If your wretched years didn't keep God from saving you, and they didn't, they won't keep God from using you. Mm -hmm. Oh, I've got chapter one figured out pretty good. <gasps> The wretched years. Chapter number two is the wasted years. Would you go back with me to Genesis, please? Are you thankful this morning that God reached down and touched a sinner and saved him? Amen. Amen. He's not looking for the perfect person. He sent us the perfect person. Amen. We're to be looking for the perfect person, Jesus Christ. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Genesis chapter number 11, please. Chapter number one is wretched years. Wretched years. And by the way, this morning, if you don't know Christ... As your Lord and Savior, you're living in some wretched times. But today, that chapter can end. Amen. Amen. At the end of service this morning, we'll give an opportunity. It's called an invitation. Yes, we're going to ask you to raise your hand while everybody else has got their head bowed. If you're lost this morning, you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you're not 100% sure that today, if you die today, that you would wake up in heaven and knowing God face to face for eternity. Today, we want you to leave that chapter behind. Come to faith in Jesus Christ. We'll share the scriptures with you privately in a different room. You Nobody will be looking at you, but heaven will be rejoicing. We'll be thankful this morning, but that's coming. So you just prep yourself for it, because we don't want you to leave this place today unsaved. Somebody yeah. say amen. Yeah. So what will the people sitting next to me think? We'll have to seek bell them down to keep them from rejoicing in the Lord this morning. Amen. Chapter number two is the wasted years. Chapter number two is the uh, verse number, chapter Genesis 11. I'm going to get myself confused here, but we're talking about the second chapter of Abraham's life. Chapter 11, verse number 31, the Bible says this, that Terah took Abraham his son and Lot, the son of Haran, his son's son, 
and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son Abraham's wife, and they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of where? Canaan. And they came to Haran, and they dwelt there. And the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Let me just pause right there. We often think that chapter 12 is when God called Abraham. God called Abraham sometime back in chapter 11 over here. God had said, Abraham, you need to do this. That's why the Bible says in chapter 12, verse 1, the Lord had said it. See, God had already spoken to Abraham and told him to leave his family and to go to the land of Canaan. But Abraham disobeyed. Abraham said, no, I'm going to take Terah with me. I'm going to take all these folks with me. Abraham disobeyed. He disobeyed the call of God to depart everything that had shaped his paganistic life, his country, his religion, and his relatives. And we need to understand something this morning. I'd love to dwell on this a little bit more. Canaan does not represent heaven. It represents the victorious Christian life. There will be no fighting in heaven. Hello? Canaan land is a lot of struggle. There's a lot of difficulty. There's work to do to gain Canaan land. There's no work to do to get salvation. A lot of things going on there. Canaan land represents the abundant life that Jesus promised all of us. It represents the victorious Christian life. How many of you understand and know this morning that when you got saved, God didn't say, what am I going to do with this person? (laughs) That when you got saved, God already had it figured out. God had something planned and prepared for you specifically. He has called you into His marvelous light. And he has called you into a, a, a good works. And he's got, a, he's got it all figured out here. And so God has already got a Canaan land for us. God has already got a place for us to live. Uh, a place of abundant living and joyful living and victorious living. Struggle, yes, but God's got all that. But here's the bottom line. You don't get there on your own terms. Amen. Abraham decided that I'm gonna, God wants me to leave my family, but I'm just going to bring everybody along with me. And he wasted many, many years there. The name of Terah means simply this. As I looked into it a little bit, it means a stopping place, a stumbling place, or a place in the desert. What a contrast with the land of Canaan that God later characterizes as a land flowing with what? Milk and honey. You see it? Abraham brought the stumbling place with him and stopped. And he wasted years because he did not obey the Lord. You won't get to Canaan on your own terms. I want to tell you this morning, as a Christian, God has designed, He has empowered, He has strengthened, He has planned out for every one of us to live victorious Christian lives. Amen. You got more than one day? We have more than one amen on that one right there? Do you know your Bible this morning? But why do so many Christians not live in victory? I didn't say everything's easy. Nothing's easy. But why do so many Christians live defeated lives? Because they've got too many terrors in their life. They've got too many things they're dragging along. They're not willing to let go of. And you're wasting time. Wasting time. For quite some time, terror was a roadblock between Abraham and doing the will of God. Haran was miles away from Canaan. Miles away. And so when terror finally got off the scene, Abraham was able to move on and God could able to speak to him again. I want to spend just a little time here. There is nothing more infuriating in my own life than waste. Now, I plan one day a week to waste. What I mean by that, it's not a waste. But I plan one week, one day a week, every week, to not do anything church-related. I have a do not disturb sign on my life on that way. All right, it doesn't matter. All right? I have one day. But I want to tell you something. I waste a lot of time. I look at all the time I've wasted watching television. Just say amen. Yeah, amen. Yeah. I look at all the time I've wasted watching television, doing things that don't matter. I look at all the time I've wasted living in sin and rebellion and hard heartedness before the Lord, knowing that my heart is hard before God and God's talking to me and convicted me, and I'm sitting there holding on to it for whatever reason, and I have wasted a lot of time. I got a lot of terror years in my life. Yeah. The Bible says in Hebrews 12, wherefore sin we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight in the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. I got a funny feeling that there are many Christians who live in, in chapter number two of the wasted years. You're not seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. How many of you how many recognize this morning that the longer time goes, the quicker the year passes? Amen. My baby turned ten yesterday. My baby turned ten yesterday. 
If you look at a picture of me when she was born, I literally look 12 years old. Right? I, mean, I, I look like a 12 year old. All right. My, I look like a 12 year old. I got I got a cap on backwards. I got this little t-shirt. I'm holding this little baby. I don't know what I, mean. I look like a 12 year old kid. All right. I know now I just look 16 or 17, but back then, I, I mean, <laughs> praise the Lord. I want to tell you something. These years are just going like this. I want to I want to make this not to be morbid, be mean spirited, or downhearted, but. The work of God is too precious and our time is too short to not serve Him. Mm-hmm. Amen. Every day brings us closer to the grave. Yeah. Yes. Hello? Yeah. Yeah. Lord, teach us the number of our days. Yeah. One of these days on earth will be my last day on this earth. I don't know what that day is. It's appointed the man wants to die in the judgment. I've got, I've got an expiration date. I have one. I'm not trying to speed it up. And you can spend all the money you want but not eating bacon and try to make it longer, but it ain't going to happen, all right? So just eat it, okay? Be happy. Bacon stuff and all that mess, all right? I don't even know what gluten is, okay? I don't even know. Amen. Amen, all right? So, Good try to this. Thank you. I don't know how much time I have, but I do know this, my brothers and sisters. I don't have enough time to waste. Amen. So, Pastor, you got something going on in your life? doesn't matter what's going on in my life. As far as I know, I'm, I'm as healthy as a horse. As far as I know, I could change tomorrow. But no matter what, if I've got 100 years left, I still don't have enough time to waste yeah. not serving God. What are you waiting on, brother and sister? What is it in your stumbling block in your life? Is it a work schedule? Is it a this? Is it a previous hurt at another church? Is it whatever it might be? Hey, listen, at the end of the day, nobody's going to answer for you but you. Yeah, that's right. Got wasted years. Wasted years. One of the gripping thoughts of my life. You know me, I'm not a morbid person. One of, the, one of the gripping thoughts of my life is this day could be my last day. So I'm going to live it up as best as I can for the Lord Jesus. Amen. Chapter number 3. Go to chapter 12. I told you I was, going to just, I was just going to mess everybody up here. Y'all still with me in the Lord this morning? Amen. See, you're either living in your, in your wretched years. You're living in some wasted years. How many of you know that you... I, again, I've asked you a lot of questions this morning. But there have been a lot of times when I've told the Lord I was going to get something right later. And that later turned into years later. Yeah. I'll get it right. I'll do that later. I'll get on that. And before too long, what I thought was going to be next week, <laughs> developed an anniversary. And then two, and then three. Wow. Wasted years. Yeah. But I want you to notice next, the wonder years. Chapter number 12. Now the Lord has said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto the land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, I will bless thee, and I make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And by the way, that's still true. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Amen. At last, at the age of 75 or so, Abraham makes his break with the wasted years. He gets rid of it. He off he goes. He leaves Haran. He goes out on this great adventure of faith. And he began to experience all the wonderful things that God had for him. All the wretched years and defilement, all the wasted years and delay, God reserved some wonder years for the rest of his life. And here I want to give you a little lesson today. Just some encouragement this morning. It doesn't matter where you've been, how long you've been there. If you start living for the Lord today, you still got some wonderful years ahead of you. Amen. Hello? Yeah. You still got some good time. So I don't know how much time I have left. Whatever time you got left, if you live it for the Lord, it'll be a wonderful time. I love that about Lisa. So what about somebody who dies on their deathbed? Well, praise God, their last breath was a breath of praise. Amen. Amen. Yes. I have lived some wretched years. I have lived some wasted years. But by the grace of God, if I'll live by faith, I can live some wonderful years. Amen. Not years of ease, not years of this. Let me give you quickly the three points this morning. Y'all still with me in the Lord today? Amen. 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 All right. It goes a little long. Uh, blame Brother Cliff. All right, he told me to go longer today. Amen. 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 Let me tell you what these what the wonder years have for you. If you live by faith, you say, Pastor, this is self help talk. God told Abraham, I'm going to do this for you, so he can encourage you. Hello. Amen. All right. Let me give you number one. If you will walk with the Lord by faith, you'll get an opportunity to walk in God's presence. Amen. In Genesis chapter number twelve, verse one, he says, "I will show thee." God literally told Abraham, I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to show you. I'm going to guide you. I'm going to lead you. Personally, I'm going to be actively involved in your life. It implies that God would literally 
have His hand there. God would direct His path. How many of you recognize this morning in the New Testament alone, Jesus said many times, I am with you. I'll go with you. Hebrews tells us, I will never leave you nor forsake you. This is a promise to whoever walks with the Lord. God's presence is going to be with your life. Amen. If you go for God, God will go with you. That's exciting. Amen. I love that. I love that if I'm going to do something, I'm going to live by faith. I'm never going to live it alone. When I was young, I heard a preacher say this. You and God make a majority in any situation. Toot, toot. Praise Amen. God for that this morning. Amen. Amen. He said, well, Pastor, uh, give me something to hang on. I want to tell you the most wonderful experience in the life of any believer is the presence of God. Amen. Amen. God's presence is God's not some abstract religious being out there. He is a personal God who actively takes a role in our life as long as we live by faith. Amen. Boy, it's an opportunity to walk in the presence of God. I'm not trying to be spooky or anything with you, but I can tell you that there are times when I've experienced God's presence greater than others. There are times when I've been in church services where God's presence was so real that it was tangible. Not spooky, not weird, nothing crazy happening. Just worship of God, mm -hmm. just God's presence being real. Can I tell you something? God desires that presence with you on a daily basis. Amen. Amen. God spoke with Moses as a man speaks to his friend. Abraham was the friend of God. That, is he still the same God? Somebody Amen. tell me right now. Well, if God could speak to Moses and God could be Abraham's friend and Abraham could be friend, God's friend, then I can too. Mm -hmm. Amen? Yes. If you walk by faith, you can experience God's presence. Number two, you get the privilege to watch God's providence. I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee. Make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. There is nothing in this world more precious than to walk with God by faith. God brings us to the place where we can totally depend upon Him and, and so that we don't... Uh, uh, struggle with our worries and our stress. Do you understand that life is stress, but God never designed you to carry it? Here's something that the Lord has taught me. If I'm going to be totally dependent upon Him, He generally brings me to a place of total dependence. Yeah. And I don't like that. <laughs> Nobody likes having zero. Yeah. I'm living by faith. God bless you. I'm not that great yet. I'm not there. I want to tell you something. You get to watch God's providence. Can I tell you in the last eight years here as pastor of this church, and can I tell you in the last 30 years of being saved, I have seen God's providential hand more ways than one. God has blessed me way beyond I ever need. He's met every need I've ever had. Those who have learned to lean on God live with a freedom and a liberty in life that people will pay millions of dollars to experience. Think about this for a second. I'm close. I'm see the runway. I'm coming down. If God is your source, where can you, and you know that, and you believe that, where can you go that He can't touch you? Amen. And where He can't help you? If God is your source, He can touch you in the, in the hospital. Yep. Amen. Amen. He can touch you and be with you when nobody else is with you. Mm -hmm. When everybody forsakes you, God will still be there. There's no place you can go in the will of God that God can't touch. Amen. And God won't touch. What a privilege to see God's providence. I read my Proverbs this morning, today is the 21st. The first verse is this, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, and as the rivers of water, he turneth it whither serve he will. The last verse of Proverbs 21 says, The house, the horse is prepared against the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord. Amen. And as I was reading that, it just reminded me, God's in charge. Amen. Yeah. Yep. His providence can go anywhere it needs to go. And thirdly, this morning, if you'll walk the walk of faith... If you live in that chapter of wonder years of trusting God, you'll see God's presence in your life and you'll see God's providence shown upon you, but you'll also begin to know the purposes of God. Verse number three, And I will bless them that bless thee, and I will curse him that curse of thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. This is my last little thing here, and I'm sharing with you we're done. The call for Abraham to live by faith was never about Abraham. So yeah, he was the object. He was the receiver of mm -hmm. blessings. But the life of Abraham was all about God doing something. Abraham, God told him, in your family, out of you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. What's he talking about there? He's talking about Jesus Christ. Amen. It's a prophecy. Mm -hmm. Maybe Abraham didn't get all of it. But God said, I'm going to do something of my purposes through you. I'm here to tell you this morning, living a life of faith is exciting for all kinds of reasons. 
But to discover the purpose of God and live out the purpose of God for our lives is the greatest pursuit this life can offer. Amen. There never is an age which is too late to serve God. And there's no age limit as to experience God's opportunities. Mm -hmm. God has reserved some wonderful years for His servants. What the locusts have taken, God will give back. Mm -hmm. And it is true that no one is too old to serve God. Mm -hmm. It's also true that no one is too young to serve God. Amen. Amen. Young people, take some testimony from some of you saints sitting around you. Don't go into your adulthood with some wasted years. Yeah. Don't go into your adulthood with some wretched years. It's not worth it. Remember thy creator in the days of thy youth. Why, don't waste the time because there's not a man or woman in here who's got a history they wouldn't stand up and say, live by faith now. Amen. Do it now. You're not missing anything. Amen. No blessings. That's right. I mean, say it name with me. Amen. Amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed today. We're going to lower the word of prayer. Thank you for letting me be lengthy today. Every head bowed, every eye closed. <coughs> Children, you've been wonderful this morning. Thank God for you. What chapter are you living in? You hear this morning, you'd say, Pastor, I'm in the wretched years. I'm not saved. I'm without Christ. I don't know Jesus as my Lord and Savior. If I died right now, if I died right now, I don't know where I'd be. I don't know where I'd end up. I hope I'd end up in heaven, but I don't know so. Well, you can know so. You hear this morning, it's, you just think about that for a minute. You hear this morning you say, Pastor, thank God God has delivered me from the wretched years. I've been saved by God's wonderful grace. I used to be one thing, but the mercy of God showed up and saved me. I know that with a shadow of a doubt that I am saved and born again. Would you raise your hand this morning? I won't call you out my name, but would you raise your hand this morning? Praise God for that. You say, Pastor, this morning I'm in the wretched years. I don't know Christ as my Lord and Savior. I'm not sure. I've been religious, but I've never been born again. I don't know what that means. That's some terminology I'm not familiar with. I thought you earned your way to heaven. The answer there is no. Say, Pastor, I, I'm in the wretched years. If you'll raise your hand in just a minute, I'm going to pray with you. I can't pray for you. I can't save you. I can't call on the Lord for you, but I can certainly pray with you. Say, here, Pastor, that's me this morning. I'm unsaved. Would you raise your hand? Anybody in the room this morning? Thank you. I see one hand. Is there any others? Any others in the room this morning? I'm unsaved this morning. I don't know if I die today. If I die, I, cry. I don't know where I'd go. Anybody else this morning? You put that hand down. Anybody else this morning? You're here this morning. Maybe you didn't raise your hand the first time. You said, I raised my hand. I'd like for somebody to show me how I could go to heaven. I'd like to know that today. With no one looking around, would you raise your hand again? Anybody in the room? Say, I, I'd like for somebody to show me today. Anybody in the room this morning? Lord, embarrass you. Let's all stand this morning right where we are. Every head bowed, every eye closed. How many of you have got some wasted years you need to get right with the Lord? Just confess them before the Lord. See, I'm living in some wasted time. What are the terrors in your life? What are the stumbling blocks? What are the stopping places, the desert places? Why live in the desert places when the land flow with milk and honey is waiting for you? You hear this morning say, Pastor, I've got some wasted things going on I need to deal with it in my life today. Would you pray for me? Can I raise your hand? Would you raise your hand? I can pray for you this morning. I see many hands today. If you're here today, I want to give you one more opportunity. You hear today say, Pastor, I'd love for somebody to talk to me about the Lord Jesus, about being saved, about being born again. If you raise your hand, I'll send somebody to you. You guys will go in a separate room. Nobody's going to look at you. You say, Pastor, I'd like for somebody to show me. Would you mind raise your hand? Are you in here this morning? Is there anybody here this morning? I understand. All righty. You're uncomfortable. I get it. Would you please talk to me at the end of service? It'd be my privilege. Father, right where we are, deal with us about these wasted years. Lord, I pray for the brother or sister who's still struggling with the wretched years of their life and they just think you're done, spent up with them. Lord, Lord, if they weren't too wretched to save, they're not too wretched to be used. Lord, you can use them. Help them to live by faith. Understand this life of faith isn't for the perfect believer, but for the perfecting believer, the one who's maturing. Father, I pray for those in this morning who got some terrors in their life, some things that they are struggling with. Lord, some things maybe they brought along in life, whatever it might be, job, person, relationship, this or that, but it is hindering them from living in a life of active service and faith for you. Father, I pray that you get rid of it, that you'd help them deal with it. And Lord, I pray that we would live in these wandering years, these wonder years, 
these wonderful years, Lord. It won't be without heartache, pain. It won't be without disappointment, failures, and missteps. But I'd much rather live in that chapter than the other two. Lord, help us to live by faith. We'll know your, your presence, your provision, and your purpose in our life. Because it's all about you. Help us live out your purposes. We praise you. We glorify you. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, Amen, Amen. Amen.